Le donne, i cavalier, l'arme, gli amori, le cortesie, le audaci imprese, io canto. This was the very beginning of Orlando Furioso, or Raging Orlando, one of the most important epic poems in Italian literature and within the European literature. It was first published in 1516, but then went uh, under a revision, a very long revision by its author, and the final version was published in 1532. After this uh, final version, the author wanted to work on a fourth version, but unfortunately he passed away and he didn't have time to do it. At a time when books were really expensive, they were an elitist product, and also at a time when the printing machine had recently been invented and it was starting to develop all across Europe, Orlando Furioso was almost uh, what we can consider a bestseller in our days, because also relative to the small percentage of the population, both in Italy and in Europe, that was literate. A small percentage of people could actually read. A small percentage of people had access to these books, these, uh, let's say, literary works that were uh, being printed and published all around Europe. So by one particular estimate, at least 113 editions of Orlando Furioso different editions appeared between 1540 and 1580. So, in short, Orlando Furioso was a massive success if we think of the context in which it was produced and it was published. Massive, massive success. For his contemporaries, it was almost compared to the greatest classic epics like Iliad, Odyssey. In fact, centuries later, Voltaire himself equaled Orlando Furioso to the greatest epics, to the Odyssey, to the Iliad, and to the Don Quixote, all combined. But the great artists and the great authors and writers of history who fell in love with Orlando Furioso are endless, are countless. In particular, I'm going to quote a couple of them. An Italian one of the 20th century was Italo Calvino, who was so much in love with Orlando Furioso that uh, he actually wrote some of his novels uh, almost uh, as a pastiche to Orlando Furioso, some humorous stories that uh, echo the same uh, imagination, the same style and uh, fantasy of Orlando Furioso. Another one who was absolutely in love with uh, Ariosto and with uh, Orlando Furioso was Jorge Luis Borges. And at the end of this uh, introduction video, I'm going to read a very brief passage from a poem by Borges called Ariosto and the Arabs that is fantastic. And many authors not only loved Orlando Furioso and read it, but they owe a lot to Orlando Furioso. For example, Cervantes with his Don Quixote, or Spencer, or Ronsard, or even Milton, somebody says, that he owes a lot to Orlando Furioso. At exactly 38,736 lines, which is three times the length of the Divine Comedy, by the way, Orlando Furioso is not easy to summarize because it's such a kaleidoscope of adventure and love, and those initial lines really summarize perfectly the content of the Orlando Furioso. Broadly speaking, it's made of three narrative lines that are intertwined, The first one is more general, and uh, it's the background, let's say, of the events. The background is the wars and constant battles between the kings of the Christendom world and the Muslim kings. Since the Orlando Furioso is uh, Orlando, he is Charlemagne's greatest warrior. So we are, from a fictional time point of view, we are back in the 8th century and uh, during the Charlemagne battles against uh, the Muslim warriors. The second thread is the love story in, in the, between Orlando and Angelica and the fact that Orlando loses his mind, loses his rationality. That's why he becomes furioso, which is not furious in the sense of anger, but furioso meaning crazy. He loses his, his mind. And the third one, in the third line, 
of this immense uh, fresco of a, of a story is the courtship and marriage of Bradamante and Ruggero, the mythical forebears of the Este dynasty, the Estensi, the, the court where the author of Orlando Furioso worked at and uh, basically his sponsors. So there is an encomiastic value to the Orlando Furioso in uh, tracing the origins of this family. The Estensi, the Este family, were the patrons of uh, the author of Orlando Furioso and they were at the court of Ferrara in Italy. The Orlando Furioso is one complete poem that you can enjoy reading from the beginning to the end and it's complete. It's, a, it's an entire world, like Italo Calvino said, it's a universe in which you can lose yourself, enter, exit, it's a world in itself, enormous, immense. However, we need to remember that it was planned as a sequel to a previous epic poem written at the same court of the Este family in Ferrara by the court poet called Matteo Maria Boiardo. And uh, this previous poem was called L'Orlando Innamorato or L'Innamoramento di Orlando, which uh, obviously was uh, inserting itself in the line of epic poems inspired by the Chanson de Roland and uh, they were all the rage in Europe, this type of uh, epic poems, but the Orlando Innamorato already in itself had some uh, new elements about it because it was not only singing about uh, nightly epic uh, events and uh, victories and uh, adventures, but it was also speaking about uh, a particular knight, Orlando, who at a certain point falls in love and love makes him stray away from his uh, war duties or from his loyalty to Charlemagne. Matteo Maria Boiardo, unfortunately, did not have the time to finish or to complete his uh, immense uh, epic poem because he died uh, towards the end of the 15th century and therefore Orlando Innamorato remained incomplete. There was a question in the air, of course, uh, in the Este court about who would be the successor uh, of Matteo Maria Boiardo, who would be such a good poet that could actually approach the task to uh, complete this uh, poem, Italian poem about Orlando. And so who was the literary genius who was able to do this, to accomplish this task, to not only complete the epic poem, but also to create and generate uh, one of the very first bestsellers of Europe. So fun, so entertaining, and, and, and so inspiring because this poem inspired so much visual arts, so many operas, uh, so many theater pieces. It was incredibly successful if we think relative to those times and also in the following centuries. Who was this genius? His name was Ludovico Ariosto. Ludovico Ariosto was born in Reggio Emilia in 1474. He was born of a fairly socially elevated family. His father wanted him to become a diplomat and a lawyer, but he, since he was really young, he realized that his real passion, his real love, was for the arts and in particular for literature and for poetry. In the year 1500, his father died. And so uh, Ludovico Ariosto, who was the first of 10 children, he had to sustain and to work to sustain and support all of his family, basically, as the, the firstborn. He therefore entered at the service of Cardinal Ippolito d'Este, who was obviously part of this very powerful Estensi family in Ferrara. And uh, Ippolito d'Este is also the person to whom the Orlando Furioso is dedicated to. But we have to look into the pages of history to realize that the relationship between Ludovico Riosto and Ippolito d'Este was not always great. In fact, Ludovico Riosto and many other people of that time um, realized and knew Ippolito d'Este as a really greedy, dry and, and mean person. He didn't like him at all, basically, although he was his patron and he had to work for him. When later on Ippolito is nominated as bishop in Hungary and uh, requests 
the services of Ludovico Ariosto in Hungary as well to follow him, Ludovico refuses to go with him for different reasons, but uh, he wouldn't, but the fact that he didn't like to work for him and with him was one of the main ones. And therefore, a period of financial difficulties started for Ludovico Ariosto. He was then nominated by uh, Alfonso d'Este, uh, another member of the Este family, as governor in uh, a region called Garfagnana, which was a pretty difficult uh, region of Tuscany to manage, but he did a good job for the few years where he was governor of, of this region, and therefore he could keep uh, a good relationship with the Este family because he performed his uh, tasks really well during that period. In 1525, he is called back to Ferrara, to the court of the Estensi, with the task to organize and coordinate all the cultural life at court. He was already a famous poet and author by then, by 1525, but he was still working and reworking on, uh, on his masterpiece, the Orlando Furioso. And as I said, the final version came out in uh, 1532, and it was just shortly before Ludovico Ariosto's death. Ludovico spent the last years of his life in Ferrara with, his, with the woman that he loved, called Alessandra Benucci. Okay, let's talk about English translations of this incredible poem, the Orlando Furioso. The very first English translation was in 1591 by the British poet John Harrington. And uh, it's still considered today a really good translation, although some experts say that this particular translation by John Harrington is more interested in uh, the beauty of the verses, in beautiful verses, than in expressing the vitality and the humor of Ariosto. Another famous translation is the one in 1831 by William Stuart Rose. This is another good translation, but some call it too literal, and therefore uh, some experts today still prefer the John Harrington translation to the William Stuart Rose translation. We can say that among the modern ones of the last uh, 100 years, um, we have a choice of uh, maybe four or five translators that are the, the ones that you will find more most commonly whenever you try to purchase a copy of Orlando Furioso in English. And, and so these main translators are Barbara Reynolds, Guido Waldman, uh, David Slavitt, and a couple more. I have purchased for myself the English version that I'm going to follow is the Barbara Reynolds one in the Penguin Classics version, which is actually divided in two books. Um, of course, it's a very long poem, but um, I also know that it reads very fast. So even if it's uh, two volumes, pretty thick ones, um, it, it reads very, very, very fast. Uh, Barbara Reynolds has um, received a lot of uh, praise for her translation. Many commentators, critics, and experts say that her verses translation is a really good one. The translation by Guido Waltman is an unabridged prose translation. Some, peop some uh, readers or even scholars call the Guido Waldman uh, translation of 1974 the best uh, translation, but we also have to remember that this is a poem written in poetry with a particular meter, meter and uh, to translate it into prose, it might lose some of its uh, power, of its, uh, uh, the power of its original language. And then finally, I'm going to uh, mention the translation by David Slavitt. There was, this is a recent translation, 2009, in verses. This is a verse translation. David Slavitt wanted to bring the comedy back into Ariosto, and this is why he is maybe less literal, but he, he tries what every translator really should try to do, which is to capture the spirit, to capture the soul of a work and infuse it in his translation. Just thinking about this type of task gives me a headache because it takes so much skill. But David Slavitt's translation also receives praises. And uh, I've, I've um, found some comments about uh, the com comparison between Barbara Reynolds and Slavitt's translation. 
by a very renowned literary critic called Steve Donoghue. You might have heard of him. And uh, uh, Steve Donoghue says about uh, these two translations, Barbara Reynolds' translation is stunning. It's an incredible achievement. Slavit says it isn't funny enough or sprightly enough. Steve disagrees with this. And uh, I'm going to share the link to Steve Donoghue's uh, article in the description of this video so you can read it. Also because it includes uh, almost a side-by-side -side example, a couple of examples of how the two translations compare. And, and that's uh, very interesting and to a technical level that I'm not able to, to achieve. I also want to make very clear that this series of videos that I'm going to publish about the Orlando Furioso are probably going to be something like uh, 25 videos. The, uh, the, the poem is uh, composed of 46 cantos and so my plan is to cover two cantos per video in uh, brief, potentially brief videos with um, references to the original language and to Italian, of course, because that's uh, what I can do. I can help you reference the English translation uh, and the original Italian, being Italian. But I'm not um, an Italian teacher, I'm not a professor, so I'm simply somebody who loves Italian literature. And this is why if things get a little bit too technical, I will have to refer to specialists, to scholars and critics. So you don't know how excited I am to begin this new series of Italian literature. I feel like a little missionary of Italian literature in the world, in the English-speaking world, for my English-speaking friends. Aww. And to conclude this introduction video, I'm going to read a very brief passage from the magnificent poem by Jorge Luis Borges by, of 1960 called Ariosto and the Arabs. As if from this enchanter's steed, Ariosto saw the kingdoms of the earth, all furrowed by war's reverie, and by young love intent to prove his worth. As if through a delicate golden mist, he saw a garden in the world that reached beyond its edge into other intimacies for Angelica's and Medoro's love. Like the illusory splendors that in Hindustan opium leaves on the rim of sight, the Furioso's loves go shimmering by in the kaleidoscope of his delight.